Good morning! Today we're going to read I Have a Dream Speech by Dr. Martin Luther King and the foreword is by Amanda Gorman. Here, sweetheart. Hey, baby. Uh, what I noticed off the bat is how similar it is with her inaugural poem. They're the same size and they're both um, this is only the one speech, and this is only her one poem. But I wanted to read this book here, uh, because I noticed that Amanda Gorman has a habit of including her name to other people's work when she originally had nothing to do with it, and... I embarked on this journey of reading everything that she wrote and making comparisons because in Call Us What We Carry, she wrote a poem based on a letter, one of them, and it was not what the letter said at all. So she distorted the original meaning, and so I looked into all of it and I made a video. I'll put it in the link below. So I just have a some questions about her integrity and her intentions especially because out of all the poems I've heard her speak on YouTube I've seen most of them I don't know if I've seen all of them and all the pieces of writing she has written the only thing that the reader learns about Amanda Gorman is that she has dreams of being a president and she was the inaugural poet for Joe Biden. That's it. There's literally nothing. And that's very odd when you are a poet because poetry is about being vulnerable and uh, expressing yourself and telling the world how you are human alongside them. It's a way to connect with the reader. But with Amanda Gorman, I personally feel so disconnected. And I find it really odd because she's one of the most well-known poets right now, but we have learned nothing about her. I don't know, you know, what her favorite color is, what struggles she went through in Harvard. Um, literally nothing about her, and this disconnect is very odd. Um, most poets reveal themselves in some type of way. So that is the reason why I'm embarking on this journey and making these videos. And also, I got this because um, I did notice her habit of putting her name in other people's words. And then I found out that she wrote the foreword for this book. And I wanted to see how that would turn out. Because in a way, it's just another example. But Oprah did a foreword for The Hill We Climb. So I was going to make a comparison of the forewords also. So, let's get into it. This is a beautiful cover. I love the design. This is from HarperCollins, and I'll read the blurb. Introducing the Martin Luther King Jr. Library with a new forward. A beautifully collectible edition of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legendary speech at the March on Washington, part of Dr. King's archives, published exclusively by HarperCollins. On August 28, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood before thousands of Americans who had gathered at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. in the name of civil rights, including the immortal words, I have a dream. Dr. King's keynote speech would energize a movement and change the course of history. With references to the Gettysburg Address, the Emancipation Proclamation, the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, Shakespeare, and the Bible, Dr. King's March on Washington address has long been hailed as one of the greatest pieces of writing and oration in history. Profound and deeply moving, it is as relevant today as it was nearly 60 years ago. This beautifully designed hardcover edition presents Dr. King's speech in its entirety, paying tribute to the extraordinary leader and his immeasurable contribution in inspiring a new generation of activists dedicating to carrying on the fight for justice and equality. And here's the, the back. 
Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 1929 to 1968, civil rights leader and recipient of the Nobel Prize for Peace, inspired and sustained the struggle for freedom, nonviolence, interracial brotherhood, and social justice. All right, so let's read the forward in this, and then in the hill we climb by Oprah. I love this design so much. All right, so here is the forward. On January 20th, 2021, I looked out an almost empty national mall, preparing at the presidential inauguration of Joe Biden. From my podium at the steps of the Capitol building, I could see the tall white glint of the Washington Monument obelisk. The early afternoon sun winking off the Lincoln Memorial reflecting pool, as well as the distant, massive marble work of the Lincoln Memorial itself. Seeing the striking silhouettes of these monuments gave my dangerously fluttering heart a physical piece of history to be grounded by. I forced my tight chest to take a deep breath and looking out at the statues, let the first line of my poem, The Hill We Climb, leave my lips. Beat by beat, I put one word in front of another. Mr. President, Madame Vice President, Americans in the world. As I spoke, I forced myself to wait and listen for the enormous ceremonial speakers to reverberate my words back to me before I continued to recite. This ensured that I wasn't talking over the long echoes of my own voice. It also let me privately embrace the echo of a moment of history from long before. That moment was August 28, 1963, when Martin Luther King Jr. recited his now-renowned speech. Okay, give me a second. Okay, I'm back. It's okay, sweetheart. So maintenance arrived in the fixed outlet, so now I can upload videos again and I have internet back. It's okay, sweetheart. It's okay. She's still looking out at the door. Like, who was that? It's okay, baby. Alright, so now, let's continue on. Um, where were we? Um, I'll start right here again. That moment was August 28th, 1963, when Martin Luther King Jr. recited his now renowned poem, I Have a Dream, from the stairs of the Lincoln Memorial. Though Dr. King and I stood in different places and times in speaking, we were essentially looking out at the same reversed views, our country and its monuments. Dr. King's speech would grow to become a monument in its own right. I'll be one made of sentences and not stone. It touched not only the 250,000 people attending the March on Washington, but also the countless others, born and unborn, who found a perennial power in his expressive cry for freedom and civil rights. Several attributes make it so powerful, including, but by no means limited to, three core elements, uh, three core elements its vision, oratory, and language. That is, what it contains, how it was communicated, and the way it was composed. First, Dr. King presented a unique revitalization of the American dream that transcended race, class, gender, and other intersections of difference. In this way, it did not only imagine a potent common ground, but also chronicled the American conscience and condition. It's okay, baby. It's okay. <laughs> the second strength of the speech lies in its extraordinary performance and execution. In the January days leading up to my recitation of The Hill We Climb, I listened to recordings of the speech constantly, trying to learn from the Reverend's electrifying and pervasive speaking style. Something we both share is the impact the black church has had on our approach to public speaking. As a young black girl who spent many a Sunday at my local black church my whole life, I've been riveted by a long-standing institution that has produced black prophets, poets, and change makers through the ages, including the likes of Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. In this, Dr. King is an extraordinary example, not an exclusive exception. I also gave 
I also argue that Dr. King's speech endures not only because of its sturdy prose, but also for its staggering poetry. Like the most wizened of rhapsodies, the ambitious reverend seamlessly marshals lyricism, figurative language, rhyme, rhythm, and rhetorical devices. His brilliant mastery of language enabled him to pen one of the most significant and poetic American texts in history. Yet because his I Have a Dream speech remains so esteemed, some have argued that the text has become overused, cliché even. Granted, this speech is just one of the endless mediums through which Dr. King spoke out for justice. Nevertheless, the expansiveness of Dr. King's work doesn't preclude us from revisiting the indelible effect of I Have a Dream. Rearranging thoroughly and curiously with such a work doesn't diminish Dr. King's lasting impact. Rather, it deepens it. The more we open ourselves to f the full breadth of his dream articulated, the more we open ourselves to the... full breadth of our shared future. This is to say, even what is renowned must be renowned again and again if it is to have any lasting meaning. It would have been impossible for me to write The Hill We Climb without approaching I Have a Dream at one, as one of the poem's many literary ancestors. If anything, it reminded me that although I stood separate and apart at the inaugural podium, I was far from alone. I was participating in a long heritage of public figures who find unfading inspiration from Dr. King's activism. We revisit I Have a Dream not to become Dr. King, but to further behold, bear up, and bring forth the entirety of his life's work. He was a singular meteor whose trajectory no one can copy, but his mission is one we can continue. That is the everlasting and ever-growing power of Dr. King's dream. It is a hope that challenges, demands, and welcomes us all. The instant I finished reciting The Hill We Climb, I could hear the slow but sure sound of the speakers blurring back at me in the crisp winter air. It was as if history itself were speaking back, reminding me of all the other giants, all the other kings, whose shoulders I am fortunate enough to stand on. My poem may have been a solo performance, but I just but I was just one voice in a chorus of people who continued to call back to Dr. King's surviving vision. I smiled, truly believing, as I still do, that the echo of Dr. King's work will always reverberate loud and clear. What's more, one day, it won't just be an echo, but an existence. Not just a dream fiercely ringing, but a dream finally realized. Amanda Gorman, Los Angeles, California, 2022. So that was the forward by Amanda Gorman in I Have a Dream and this I shall read Oprah's forward in The Hill We Climb. She's still looking out the door. <laughs> All right, so this is the forward by Oprah Winfrey. They don't come very often. Those member, those these moments of incandescence, where the welter of pain and suffering gives way to hope, maybe even joy, where a deep distress that has dodged our souls and shaken our faith, so difficult to articulate and even harder to bear, is transformed into something clear and pure, where wisdom flows in cadences that sync with the thrum of our blood, the beat of our hearts where grace and peace in human form take the measure, seeing where we've been and where we must go, lighting the way with her words. She was exactly what we'd been waiting for, this skinny black girl descended from slaves, showing us our true selves, our human heritage, our heart. Everyone who watched came away and enhanced with hope and marveling at seeing the best of who we are and can be through the eyes and essence of a 22-year-old, our country's youngest presidential inaugural poet. As her words washed over us, they healed our words and resurrected our spirits. A nation, bruised but whole, climbed up off, to, off its knees, and finally a miracle. We felt the sun piercing never-ending shade. That is the power of poetry. 
and that is the power we collectively witnessed at the inauguration of President Joseph R. Biden on January 20th, 2021. The day Amanda Gorman, profoundly presenting her fullest, most radiant self, rose to the microphone and the moment, giving us the gift of the hill we climb. All right, so now we read forward by Amanda Gorman, and I have a dream, the speech by Dr. King, and we read the forward by Oprah Winfrey and Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem book, The Hill We Climb. So let's make a comparison here of it. What I notice off the bat is that Amanda Gorman somehow in her forward, made it about herself, more about herself than Dr. King, which I personally uh, disliked, whereas Oprah didn't mention herself once. And like I said before, Amanda Gorman hasn't told the reader anything about herself in almost any poem that she's written or spoken about, at least that I have come across and Call Us What We Carry is over 200 pages and there's quite a few um, spoken word poetry on YouTube. So all that we learn, like I said, is that she wants to be president and um, it just repeats the same thing. She's an inaugural poet, you know, and it's like we know that, but this, this is about Dr. King. And what I also didn't um, like very much in the forward. Let's go back here. It's something little that a lot of people would brush off, but it's the little things that we all need to pay attention to because they could be a uh, red flag. So I did not like this poem. I find, I mean, this sentence in the book because I find it unnecessary and a little bit rude. Here, look. Yet, because I have a dream speech remains so esteemed, some have argued that the text has become overused, cliche even. And I completely disagree with that. There's nothing cliche about I have a dream. It's extremely powerful and empowering. Sorry. And, um... So, it, it's... A lot of people would brush it off, but if you really think about this sentence, she's, she said something negative about this speech, even in the slightest. Um, and she does say some have argued that the text has become overused, cliched even. So she's saying other people and not herself. However, I find this to be completely unnecessary to put in a forward about the speech. And I, I, I don't know, to me, it just seems a little bit rude. Like, there's, there's no point in even mentioning that at all. And I don't even agree. I don't think it's cliche at all whatsoever. Maybe some people do think so. I don't. Um, you know, if you say famous words or quotes, it's going to be repeated throughout time. That's just, you know, what happens when you make a powerful speech or, you know, there's a powerful quote by you. It just people refer to it in the future all the time it, that doesn't make it cliche at all so I, I didn't particularly like that and it, and it bugs me um, so in my honest opinion about this forward and it's funny because I was thinking about this before I, I even read this uh, forward I, I was wondering because in the hill we climb all it is is just a poem and nothing and I did a review saying how I think she could have wrote about the experience of being on the podium, speaking to all those people, being on live TV, and expressing the feeling she had. Because most of us will never have that experience in our lives. And there's a ton of young poets, young writers, who look up to Amanda Gorman. And so they will never have that experience themselves. It would have been very nice to give readers that experience even if they would never actually physically have that experience and um she kind of mentions it in her forward in this book so i was like oh okay but i don't know why she didn't just talk about that in this one she could have even made it a a poem you know 
because it still has to do with the hill we climb. So she could have had the original poem and then made a poem about her experiences and then she could have written about the struggles at Harvard, you know, the obstacles that it took to get to where she was. Like, how did she get that opportunity to become an inaugural poet? You know, many young readers are going to want to know that because many young readers will have that dream also. Like, did she go through a bunch of obstacles or did she just know people who know people? You know, I personally don't know how she got that opportunity, but I would like to know, you know, and she published this um, really quick. I mean, I love the presentation of this book because it matches with her outfit. So I like that. But um, she published this book real quick uh, after the, the speech. And I was thinking uh, that it was kind of like a cash grab in a way. Uh, in my own opinion, I'm not against cash grabs, especially in the economy right now. I fully understand there's a bunch of you know, if I take a feminist approach to it, this, uh, I would, I am not against cash grabs. There are single mothers who don't have time to, you know, write something full length or anything. So they write Instagram poetry with the hour of free time they have at peace, you know, when their kids are busy doing something else. So I'm not here to judge anybody for doing cash grabs at all whatsoever you know i commend parents who use the little bit of free time they have to even publish something at all you know being a parent that's a full-time job you know and then you consider whether they go to school or they have another job anyway so what i'm saying is i'm not against cash grabs at all whatsoever but amanda gorman's not a mother and i don't think she needed money she went to harvard She's well known. So I feel like this was really rushed and she did have the time to add more substance to the book for the readers. Um, let, letting the readers know more about her and her struggles and what it took to be where she is at. Um, because we have learned absolutely nothing about her and everything that I've read, I, I literally don't know anything about her from her own words. The only thing I've known uh, I've come across as she had a speech problem, but that wasn't from Amanda Gorman's words. That's from other people talking about her. So I do find it a bit odd. And uh, I feel that when you have fans and young people that look up to you, you want to give them more. And I feel like she should have done that with this book. Like, because this is going to be in schools, right? So why not add that? Why not have that connection with the reader? Instead of feeling like, like to me, if I was a young person and I, like, you know, I'm a kid and I read this and I want to be an inaugural poet, I can't connect with her in any way. I know absolutely nothing about her. She would come off to me feeling like a stranger that had a privilege that most people don't have because all I know is that, you know, she went to Harvard and she knew people who knew people and that's it. Like... I'm just being completely honest, and it, and it kind of bugs me a little bit. I mean, I don't know if that's the case, but how am I supposed to know as a reader what it took to get to where she's at? And she could have added more poems in here. And I was like, wow, it would have been like an absolutely beautiful idea to write a poem about being on the podium from all those people. So those who will never have the opportunity will be able to, you know, envision themselves in those shoes and have that experience, even if it's not literal you know so I think she should have done more with this book in my own personal opinion I already did a book review but this is kind of like adding on to my first book review of this book and uh, also what I noticed with her writing in this one and that one let's see here she, I mentioned this in the review of The Hill We Climb. She capitalizes the word black as an emphasis. And I'm wondering why that is so. I mean, if you just look at Amanda Gorman, you know she's black. It's like we don't need it to be emphasized. I mean, especially when your picture's on the back. And I'm just wondering why she... Uh, um, 
I mean, there's nothing wrong with it at all. But I'm, I was just curious, like, even in the forward with, by Oprah Winfrey, right here, see? It's capitalized black. So I'm wondering as to why that emphasis is there when we can clearly sh see that she is. I mean, yeah, like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just wondering why I would like to know. And, um, uh, yeah, so that is the comparison of the forwards from uh, Dr. Luther King Jr. in his I Have a Dream speech and the forward in The Hill We Climb by Amanda Gorman. And now I want to read the speech that um, from Amanda's words, a lot of people call cliche, and I disagree with that. I have a dream speech, August 28th, 1963. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand by signed the Emancipation Pro Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon of a beacon light of hope to millions of end slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But one hundred years later, the end still is not free. One hundred years later, the life of the end is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the end lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the end is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring the sacred obligation, America has given the end people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so we've come to cash this check a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. <clears throat> we have also come to this hollowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in a luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of grandulism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering summer of the end's legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. And those who hope that the end needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the end is granted his citizen ship rights. The whirlwind of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads to the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. 
Let us not seek to, to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the end community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, and have come to realize their destiny is tied up with our destiny, and they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the, the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the end is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of br police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the end's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We, cannot, we can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as the end in Mississippi cannot vote in and an N in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty steam. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail, jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Can you continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Okay, I'm back. So I realized after looking at the alarm that I had to hurry up and get ready for work. And now um, we're, I'm back home and we're gonna finish reading this. And here's Sweetheart. Hey, baby. All right. Go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racists, 
with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. One day right here and right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out the mountain of despair and stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening allegenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mohill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let re freedom ring. And when this happens, and when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every day, or every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old and spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. And that is the speech about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 1929 to 1968, civil rights leader and recipient of the Nobel Prize for Peace, inspired and sustained the struggle for freedom, nonviolence, interracial brotherhood, and social, social justice. About Amanda Gorman. Amanda Gorman is the youngest presidential inaugural poet in U.S. history. She is a committed advocate for the environment, racial equality, and gender justice. After graduating cum laude from Harvard University, she now lives in her hometown of Los Angeles. Amanda was one of five variety power of women honorees and cover star, one of three cover stars for Glamour's Women of the Year and one of Time Magazine's Women of the Year. The special edition of her inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb, was published in March 2021. About her debut picture book, Change Sings, was released in September 2021. And her poetry collection, Call Us What We Carry, was released in December 2021. All debuting at number one on the New York Times, USA Today, and Wall Street Journal bestseller list please visit the amandagorman.com. And there you go.
And that is the end of this here. So to me, obviously, it's quite clear that is such a beautiful and powerful speech by Dr. King. And I couldn't imagine anybody even suggesting that it is cliche, even in the slightest, because it's clearly not. So I just felt like that line in um, her forward in this book was a bit unnecessary. And I felt that her forward that she wrote about being at the podium should have been in this book instead. And she should have focused more on Martin Luther King Jr. instead of herself in a forward. Okay, so here, um, looking at what a forward is in a book, I'll read this really quick. A preface is a piece of literature that introduces the reader to the author in the book. It is generally written by someone other than the author or an editor of the book. Forwards can also act as a form of book endorsement. They often come from famous people or organizations that support, that support or oppose certain ideas or products. The forward is important for two reasons. It gives a preview of what kind of book this is going to be, and it can also act as a promotional tool by getting attention of the audience. There are three main types of forwards, introduction, preface, and epilogue. An introduction is used to welcome readers to the book and provide some background information. A preface is included at the beginning of the book and provides context of the story being told. An epilogue is used to conclude a book and offer suggestions on how to move forward. Books usually include a foreword when they are published. Authors may want to write their own forewords or ask others to do so for them. Sometimes authors will even hire publicists to write forewords for them. People who know how to write, or sorry, people who know about books expect to find an introduction chapter before they start reading the book. This allows them to get a sense of what the book is about and whether it is something they want to read. So I mention that because like I said before, I feel like she should have mentioned what it was like to be on the podium in this book. Even though she does include her inspiration from Dr. King, I personally would have wanted her to speak more about Dr. King himself, maybe add some more background about him. And yeah, because I mean, when you look at Oprah Winfrey's, Oprah doesn't even mention herself at all whatsoever most forwards don't people don't talk about themselves you know so to me i don't know maybe i'm just overthinking it it seemed a little bit odd to me and it's just repeated over and over and over she was you know the youngest inaugural poet it's like we know that but what else about her i, I want to know i want to know who she is you know she wrote a beautiful poem the hill we climb is like an amazing piece of art you know and I would love to get to know her as a person I would love to see her write about herself I want to be able to connect with her I want to I think a lot of people want to know more about her and how she ended up where she is so I hope in the future um she lets herself be a little more vulnerable and so the audience can get to know her and feel comfortable with her and understand her. And yeah, that's just my opinion. Um, I mean, both, I mean, the speech obviously is groundbreaking and then Amanda Gorman's poem was beautiful. And I just wanted to talk about the forward a little bit and how I think it should have been more about Dr. King than herself. And she should have wrote from about the podium being up there in this one instead. So I'm, I don't want to repeat myself again. But yeah, so that's all I wanted to do real quick. And also, um, I wanted to read this because it was MLK Day the other day. And I'm educating myself. And also, this book, because I'm some of the poems in Call Us What We Carry are sourced from this book too. So I decided since I bought this book, I might as well read the whole thing. I already started and I got a lot highlighted. So I'm educating myself in the process and this has been fun um, doing these projects here. And that's all I wanted to say. Hope you have a good day. Bye.